The bartenders are attentive, but selectively. They keep the liquor flowing and the cash registers ringing, but often don't notice when one of their patrons careens off the door jam and weaves into the night. That might have been what happened the night 20-year-old Margaret Keneally was killed. This is the Beachcomber Bar along Wollaston Beach in Quincy. Last August, Margaret left this bar exactly what time is in some dispute and was struck and killed by a car while trying to cross the street. She was extremely intoxicated at the time and was hit by a drunk driver. In Massachusetts, it is against the law to serve alcoholic beverages to intoxicated persons. Licensing authorities have the right to revoke or suspend the license of any establishment that violates that law. But it is rarely, if ever, enforced. If it had been, Teresa Keneally might not be mourning the death of her daughter today. It's a tragedy. And that's such an easy word to say when you've never suffered one. And I'm just pretty much like anybody else. I've read things in the paper and I've said, oh, isn't that too bad? But I really had no, no idea mm. until this hit us. It just doesn't seem as if bar owners or bar tenders are thinking of the safety of their patrons or the safety of the public. They are in a business, and it's a money-making business, and the more, if I go into the bar, the more I drink, the more I spend. This is money in the till. Few bar owners accept responsibility for drunken patrons once they walk out the door. The cost of this irresponsibility is often paid by the driving public that is victimized by drunk drivers. Some bars are more wide open than others, with prolonged patterns of alcohol-related incidents. Many say the beachcomber is one of the worst. Andy Klein is the chief of probation in Quincy. He says that in the last year alone, there have been four alcohol-related deaths which involved patrons of the beachcomber. From what we see in court, the beachcomber is a high generator of people who then get subsequently arrested in this court for charges of drunken driving, motor vehicle homicide, or other criminal activities. And I think when you generate a lot of activity that we see a pattern where that's ha happening, you have what I call a killer bar. You have a bar that's making a profit that's resulting in deaths and a lot of criminal behavior and a lot of mayhem in the community. We don't feel that it's a, uh, a killer's bar. We've always tried to run it properly. We have police officers, two police officers inside the door. Jim McGetrick is the owner of the Beachcomber Bar. Our problem is we don't know how much they drink in the car or on the beach once they leave here. Our responsibility is here, and if they're feeling good, then we shut them right off. There are some bars that have a clientele probably just as busy as any others, and we never see their patrons in court, and there are other bars that we see them consistently in court. And it's got to be more than a matter of luck. The situation here is a complex one. Bartenders argue they can't always tell whether or not a patron is drunk. But the state's highest court ruled recently that a bar may be liable for damage caused by its patrons, whether the bartender knew the patron was going to drive or not. Richard Shire will be using the court's precedent-setting decision as part of his case against Joe's Spa, a bar in East Bridgewater. He's suing the bar because his 16-year-old son, Paul, was killed by a drunk driver who had been drinking at Joe's Spa. Managers, bartenders, and servers of liquor should take full responsibility. The social attitude today by bartenders and managers and by drinkers, when last call comes around, what do they get? They were, backed up. You aren't kidding. They order two or three even to make sure that they got a little bit more uh, liquor. And what happens is immediately after that, the bar closes and they go out and hit the road. Is there a solution to that problem, the problem of drinking and driving? I wish I could answer that for you. I don't know how I could be responsible for all of society's problems. It's just, it's a tough problem today. The movement to identify and control true killer bars is growing. Legislation is currently being drafted that would require that probation officers record where convicted drunken drivers were served so that any killer bars could be identified and reprimanded. Mounting public pressure is causing a few bar owners to develop their own solutions to the problem. Quincy bar owner Carl Miranda. I'm not in the business to get people drunk. I'm basically in the entertainment business. And for me, to have someone go out on the road and kill somebody, I mean, that's my responsibility. I'd hate to, hate, I don't want to bear that responsibility. What we will do is, is, if a customer feels he's had too much to drink, we will send them home in a taxi cab, and we will pay for that taxi cab. Obviously, Carl Miranda's solution is the exception rather than the rule. Most bar owners aren't about to buy their patrons' cab rides home, and no one really expects them to. 
Most people would argue, though, that bartenders have a greater responsibility than just pouring as many drinks as they can sell. At some point, the guy throwing down the shots at the bar becomes the guy behind the wheel headed home. And that's what the outcry is all about. I don't begrudge bars the right to make a buck. That's what they're there for. And I go to bars, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think a, a bar has a right to make a buck off the bodies of, of their patrons or the victims of their patrons. to Curtin at the Trinity Square Repertory Company in Providence, Rhode Island. Repertory theater is different than most commercial theater productions in that the acting company is in a permanent residence here. They draw from a pool of plays and perform to a more or less permanent community audience. But the audience here in Providence is especially lucky, for Trinity Square is one of the best repertory companies in the country. Here, boy, here! The door. There, the oh, my wife send you letters! No, no, anyway, how do you know it's your wife's handwriting? These days all women write letters. Uh, I know it. Anyway, I'm not going to see her. It's Turnell. Turnell. It's... The man who walked out here? Yes. Good, I kill him. No, it... Trinity offers quality theater at a fraction of the price of commercial Broadway productions. Performances like Of Mice and Men, On Golden Pond, and this classical French farce, A Flea in Her Ear, have earned them a national reputation. They have performed nationally televised plays on several occasions, and last year they were awarded the prestigious Tony Award as the best repertory theater in the country. The company was started 18 years ago by its artistic director, Adrian Hall, a pioneer in the repertory theater movement. Our battle cry was decentralize the theater give the theater to the people. That's really what we were about. Prior to, say, 1964, when Trinity actually began, um, there simply was no American theater. Today, you, you, you see that um, here, we're in downtown Providence, Rhode Island. Every week of the year, from September to June, uh, there are 16 performances a week in the two different theaters. And this is a a very wonderful kind of um, audience participation atmosphere. And you, you, won't, you won't get this atmosphere in, in New York City, or you won't get this atmosphere in Hollywood. These are people in the community who belong to this theater. The theater is theirs. I mean, one annual visit to New York City to see Greece is simply not acceptable. I mean, there's, there, there's more to a, a life with participation in the theater than that. Cells will be unlocked and the prisoners taken to chapel for morning prayers. Developing local theater in Providence hasn't always been easy. At times, many in the community were dissatisfied with the types of plays presented by Trinity. Many wanted more entertainment and fewer controversial experimental productions. But Trinity has maintained its artistic integrity and has slowly gained the respect of the community. Vincent Cianci is the mayor of Providence. They uh, had trouble getting accepted by some parts of the community, but they always were great contributors. It's like having the Pittsburgh Steelers in town. Uh, they had a great cultural dimension, and um, it adds a great deal of, uh, I think, um, uh, not only culture, but a great deal of, uh, of enjoyment to all types of people, whether it's high school students, or whether it's uh, senior citizens, or whether it's people who are just interested in seeing a broad array of repertory theater that they couldn't see anywhere else in America. <laughs> shop at Trinity Square, where props and sets for all the shows are created right here. It's one of the differences between repertory and most commercial theater. Here it's done much like it was in the days of Shakespeare. One company, in-house, does it all. 
It's amazing. It's amazing how many people are involved in it. It's amazing how many volunteers are involved. It's amazing how many commercial artists are involved. It just goes back to the thing of, of um, kind of real quality work that truly involves the community. What an extraordinary thing to say, Mr. Ruth. Oh, don't Mr. Root me. But I never expected to hear you say such a thing, Mr. Ruth. Let me just stop just for a second. Richard, uh, is this the kind of drivel that you... But the real bread and butter of the theater is the actors and actresses who perform here. Just as the repertory theater is a place for the community to see a variety of plays, it's also a place for the acting company to be challenged by a variety of roles. Barbara Orson has been acting with Trinity since it began 18 years ago. If the, if the material and the role is something that you really feel very excited about, I mean, you simply can't wait to get to the theater. And if the rehearsals are going well, even if they're going poorly, the whole, the whole fascination of working on a new piece, a new author, a new time, a new place, I have found continually exciting. Oh, the door up the back stairs, then you won't bump into our clients with your pile of sheets. Well, I think I've always wanted to be in repertory because I, I feel a, a, a great need to do different roles and in different plays. And uh, what happens is the people get uh, typecast, and then they repeat it and they repeat it. They do that on television and they do that in the movies. Well, that's not what I went into the theater for. repertory company undoubtedly will continue the tradition of excellence that is established in the last 18 years. Robert Brewstein, the artistic director of the American Repertory Theater in Cambridge, says that Providence is lucky to have them. So is American theater. <laughs> Through the theater you get information. Through the theater you get entertainment. Through the theater you get the kind of communal participation in an event that uh, man just has not been able to come up with anything comparable to it in 2,000 years. everyone. Nonetheless, I'm sure most of you are wondering, what the heck in tarnation is a guy like me doing here inside your TV set? Well, folks, the answer to that question is quite simple. I'm here to introduce someone, and that someone is Gene Blake. 10 for good buddy Gene. You there? Come on in, Gene. Gene? Hello? That is Stubby Malone, a well-known character around Boston these days because he's part of a popular comedy act. It's a group known as Slap Happy. As the name implies, they try to be as funny as they can and make you laugh. That's not always an easy job, but boy, do they have a good time trying. Slap Happy's show is different than most stand-up comedy in Boston. It's more vaudeville with juggling and music than just straight joke telling. Their show includes a lot of political social satire and often crass college humor. While some of their routines could be considered offensive, they have built a wide following among the under 30s crowd here in Boston. Last year, the Boston Globe chose them as the best new comedy act in town. Jeff Ernstoff, Alan Jacobs, Jan Kirshner, and Brian O'Connor are slap happy. There are a lot of different aspects that go into comedy, and a lot of times it's, it's just finding the reflex in people, you know, something that they would like to cry at or uh, something that they think is very serious and just turning it around slightly so that they can laugh at it, so that they can re release that energy in that way rather than releasing it in a, in a sad way. Ideally, what we want to be able to do is to develop comedy that will play 
you know, at, at any point, any time, that we could keep in the show for 20 years that will always work. Yeah, you, you can never try and guess what, what people are going to think is funny. I mean, when we first got together, we didn't want to make compromises in what we thought was funny. And as a result, by doing what we thought was funny, it turned out that they seemed to think it's funny also. John, why are you talking into a juggling club? <laughs> people, people these days really need to laugh. Um, I mean, you can see it. You can see it in their faces when they come in. It's an you know, extremely gratifying feeling to know that you know, you made somebody feel better. If you can be funny and get paid for it, um, you know, to the four of us, that's, you know, the greatest joy in the world, really. Making it in comedy is not easy. One doesn't just stand out on the street corner, tell jokes, and become famous overnight. It takes a peculiar talent, a willingness to laugh at what others might take seriously, and the persistence to carry you through the hard work and long hours. Slap Happy isn't getting rich from their work. Their admission prices are usually three to four dollars, but they do say they're making a living. Larry Goldberg is Slap Happy's manager. In order to be successful, the group has to offer something that's different. We're not stand-up comedians. We're not a rock band. We're offering something very unique. And so in many ways, we're not competing with anyone else in the country. So what we can offer is something that people just haven't seen before, not since the days of vaudeville, really. At this point, the group is surviving on their work, but I and the group is very interested in going beyond survival. We can all survive in many different ways. We want to thrive by our work, and that's where we have to take it next. Slap Happy's hard work has paid off. They've played a season at Boston's Charles Playhouse, and they're repeatedly called back to colleges throughout New England. But the group's biggest challenge still lies ahead as they try to reach beyond their Boston audience into the national spotlight. It's going to be interesting when we move out of the, quote, liberal Northeast, you know, and, and either appeal to a national audience, try to, or something like a Las Vegas crowd, or even go south. The thing we're, we're trying to learn more and more is to just keep being satisfied with our own work. The challenge is that it's a very tough industry, and we can't kid ourselves in that a lot of people are trying to do the same thing in terms of making it. We have to maintain our integrity. Um, we've always considered ourselves to have a show that goes beyond some of the easy, cheap humor. And we want to be able to maintain that at the same time as making it. from one to another in front of you and behind you in an attempt to pick that cigarette out of your mouth while juggling. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. We've done it once before. Whether Slap Happy will be able to attract a national audience remains uncertain. As they gain wider exposure, they will be faced with major decisions about whether or not they will have to water down some of the material in their act to appeal to a more general audience. One test will come next month in a show they'll be performing in New York City, a show they hope will lead to bigger and better things. We like to think that we epitomize the philosophy of, of Frank Sinatra, really. Uh, we're interested in doing it our way, and or no way at all. We, so we're quitting. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. <laughs>